very lucky to have Rick Barth this morning. Um, I'm just going to read uh, a little bio about some of his uh, interests and research areas and accomplishments. Um, he is an MSW uh, and a PhD um, in social work and is the dean currently of the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland. But he's previously held professorships at both the University of North Carolina and uh, Berkeley as well. Uh, Rick has worked on a wide range of topics related to child welfare, including uh, kinship care, evidence-based practice, home visiting, parent training, um, and adoption. And he was the co-principal investigator of the National Survey of Child and Adolescent Wellbeing. Um, you probably read some of the NSCA articles in class, um, so that's uh, Rick's and, and colleagues' survey. And that's the very first national probability study of child welfare studies um, in the world. He was the 1998 recipient of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Research from the National Association of Social Workers, the Flynn Prize for Research in 2005, and the Peter Forsyth Award for Child Welfare Leadership from the American Public Human Services Association in 2006, the Distinguished Achievement Award of the Society for Social Work and Research in 2010, and the Friends of Adoption Award from the North American Council on Adoptable Children in 2012. He's currently the president of the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, and he's the adoptive parent of two children and the grandfather of one. And just on a personal note, um, so I've known Rick since um, uh, my days as a student, and um, Rick will, uh, Rick is, I, in my opinion, one of the premier leaders in the field of child welfare research. I, I feel like he's done more to move this uh, area of, the, of social work forward in terms of its rigor, in terms of the expanse of our knowledge. Uh, but he also has done a tremendous amount for the profession of social work. Um, and, and that, I think, um, uh, is something that maybe people know less about. So he's, he's um, really brought to light and educated the larger public about what we do. Um, and is constantly looking for ways to, um, to highlight social work at the national level. Um, and he's just a really nice guy. Awesome. So welcome him. Thank you, Christy. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, I am sure that someday someone will um, say those same things about Christy, who's really becoming a great leader in our field. Um, it's a pleasure to come back to Madison. Uh, I was here about 10 years ago and remember that fondly. Uh, I, of course, like anyone my age, was um, weaned on Al Kadushin's Child Welfare Services book. Uh, I still use that framework in my uh, course when I teach child welfare policy, which isn't all that much anymore, uh, but I occasionally get a guest lecture here or there. And uh, so I have, um, I'm indebted to the University of, Madison, of uh, Wisconsin and Madison and uh, the work that's been done here. Uh, this talk today is about outcomes of child welfare services. I wrote a paper with Mary Ann Berry um, in 1987 uh, that was in Social Service Review on the outcomes of child welfare services, and I've been trying to keep up with that ever since. Uh, never have managed to write another paper entirely, but have always tried to keep that framework in mind. Today's presentation will um, have some new information in it. I've tried to take some time. I've got lots of lead time in accepting this invitation to can go back to doing some reading and refreshing uh, what uh, I think is available with regard to the outcomes of child welfare services. Uh, although, given my schedule and a few things that happen when you're a dean, uh, this isn't quite as coherent as I'd like it to be because every seven minutes there's something else to do. So then I go back and say, where was I? Well, I know this is a really great study. I'm going to put it in here. And later on, I'm going to go back and reassemble it and make it all perfectly coherent uh, in terms of its ordering. That, didn't, that part didn't happen. Um, but uh, in any event, the reason why I think this is very important is that uh, in the aggregate and then for specific issues, I think it is critical that we have a good understanding of what we are really able to contribute and areas where maybe we're not contributing as much. Um, I don't have a significant piece in here, for example, about residential care, which has been a concern of social work since the White House conference on children in 1909 and even before that. Um, but that's an area where I think the scholarship, and I have done a fair amount of writing about that, the scholarship suggests that we're not getting as much from residential care as we had anticipated. And I'll mention some other places along the way. On the other hand, the, the big picture is that um, 
we have a huge contribution to make. And my thinking is that just as people are starting to write more and more about early childhood trauma and all the things that compromise the cognitive capacity of children and their ability to respond to environmental changes that they need to respond to in order to be successful, that people will start to put those pieces together with what we do in child welfare services and really come to understand the many ways that we are helping. So my goals for today is to present some of what we know about the outcomes. I, we'll be talking for quite a while, but still don't plan to be encyclopedic, um, and to try to encourage along the way some ideas about how we could be doing better. So there are many different purposes of child welfare services. Um, the, the three that everybody talks about are safety, permanency, and continuity, and child well-being. And why do I put permanency and continuity instead of just the usual safety, permanency, and well-being? Because uh, I think it's really important to recognize, and I think there's growing evidence in terms of the recognition, that permanency, if you think of it as legal permanency, does not necessarily trump continuity, if you think about that as being in a stable, ongoing placement. That um, we had a real fascination with legal permanency for a long time. It's still important. I don't mean to diminish it too much. But there's growing evidence that things like guardianship and just stable placements may be as important to children as actual legal permanency in, in many ways. Legal permanency is significant in others, but I want to keep both of those concepts at least briefly in mind. Child well-being, and then the other one that most people don't talk about is social benefit. So uh, every public policy should have some benefit beyond the recipients of the public policy. Um, it generally does, because otherwise you wouldn't have enough votes to get this you know, public policies passed. And it's really important that we be thinking about not just children who are in a child protective caseload or should be in a child protective caseload as the recipient, the benefit of our services. There's a social benefit as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the dollars and cents, but there's also a benefit that we provide people when they don't have to um, uh, know about, deal with, um, believe it's occurring on a regular basis, that children are being degraded, um, that children are being harmed, that um, we're not really doing enough to protect um, vulnerable children. And that in and of itself is a benefit to our society, um, independent of the, somewhat independent of the benefit that's provided to the children themselves. When I wrote the, you probably can't read that from the back, but, uh, and there will be other slides that will suffer from the same malady, but um, I'll try to take you through them. When I wrote the paper, when Mary and I wrote the paper on outcomes of child welfare services, we had a really nice little matrix. And this is the basic matrix. We talked about in-home services, down the left-hand side, um, in-home services, long-term foster care, kinship care, um, because there was a lot of long-term foster care. In 1987, there were a lot of kids who came into care at two or three, and they stayed in care. That's not the case in, in the way that it used to be. Um, guardianship and adoption, and then we took each of those and we tried to cross-hatch them against um, whether there was re-abuse, some kind of failure in the service basically, whether the placements were stable, whether there were some measurable developmental outcomes, and what the youth and child satisfaction was. How much did the, uh, the service recipients actually value the service, which of course is a, a critical characteristic of good services. Um, my brother, um, who works for the state of Connecticut um, Department of Social Services, says uh, you want to give help that feels like help. And um, that's the notion there is that, you know, how much do we know about that? I'm not going to take you through this exact framework. Uh, I'm going to just revise it a little bit. Um, I've taken safety and put that in. Um, into some other parts. I'll talk about safety in a range of different places, talk about well-being in some other places. Um, and I won't talk too much about child and youth satisfaction because, interestingly enough, um, most of that work, the, the work on child and youth satisfaction has not expanded that much. Uh, what, what we struggle with in that way, and, the, and one of the reasons why I didn't want to talk too much about it, is that um, we certainly the main voice we get about child and youth satisfaction is from older kids who have remained in foster care long enough to stay connected enough to have their voices heard, okay? So that's a big sampling problem because most kids who receive child welfare services are not 17 or 18. Most of them don't stay connected to child welfare services long enough 
to really get engaged and become voices for child welfare services. And so um, with the preponderance of children who get child welfare services being younger than 12 uh, and having child welfare services for a fairly short period of time, uh, I think we, we have to be careful about how we interpret the youth voices piece. It's important, um, but it is, um, it is somewhat limited. Uh, so I'm going to talk about child safety. These are some of the topics that I will touch on, but certainly um, not all of them. So the key component that everyone would agree on in, as a fundamental goal of child welfare services is certainly child safety. Um, it's the highest priority. It's named in every piece of legislation. Uh, you know, the Adoption Safe Families Act was different from the Family Preservation uh, and Family Support Act insofar as it really emphasized safety. And uh, almost everything else that has passed in any way uh, since then has um, done that. I think there's a pendulum swing back um, now. I don't think people are talking about safety as much. Uh, we see um, significant declines in the number of children who are being reported, investigated, and who remain in foster care. Uh, it could be because we're just doing a better job in our society at protecting kids. It could be that we're finding ways to serve them better in the community and it could be that there's less concern about safety. One of the uh, messages that I will bring today is that we cannot let down our guard about safety, that the safety issues are still um, very uh, large and um, that safety <laughs> is, um, safety in terms of issues like mortality are, are still significant, those issues, but also uh, raise the question of whether or not um, really, so, so there are other ways that safety is an issue. So if a child's well-being drops so considerably that they become depressed, become a risk to themselves, become very high in terms of conduct problems, are fighting with other kids, heading towards juvenile services, all of those ways that well-being may be compromised um, through child maltreatment and may or may not be corrected through child welfare services also become safety issues. So um, we know that um, the safety issues are, are broader than just some of the things I'll focus on, which are really the most um, adverse outcomes like child mortality. So from NSCAL, and this is NSCAL 1, there's now been a second. So there was six years of NSCAL 1. We followed families for six years. Uh, NSCAL 2 is to try to take another sample and see whether things had changed a lot since NSCAL 1 was collected at the end of the last century and NSCAL 2 was collected mid uh, like 2006 or so, um, and, uh, but this is NSCAL 1, and um, one of the things we looked at over the first 18 months is how many children had at least uh, one re-report, so not their first report, but a subsequent report. So about half of children, 56%, had another re-report in the next 18 months. We're not talking about years from then, but in the next 18 months. Um, and as you can see, there's a substantial number about 40 something percent that had two or more um, re-reports. So getting re-reported is very common. Welcome, just gotten started. You have not missed a single thing. Um, good to have you here. Uh, one of the things that I think is most conserving, we often think that re-reports are for kids who are older and they run away uh, or they're, you know, something's going on where they're you know, in high family conflict. Um, but a lot of the re-reports were for young children. Uh, in fact, children younger than six were most likely to have multiple re-reports. So uh, now a re-report doesn't mean that there was necessarily harm. Um, a re-report could just be someone's concern. And, um, but uh, we'll also see that there's uh, some pretty harsh parenting going on and that there are, are other reasons to think that these re-reports do represent a safety issue. And, there's also some evidence that kids who are multiply reported over and over end up having significant other harms. Uh, there's some great work in um, Missouri uh, by the Institute for Applied Research that has followed kids over 10 years and showed that kids with lots of re-reports, especially for neglect, end up having very, very poor educational outcomes, for example, um, because we may think that they're not um, unsafe, but on the other hand, we can imagine that they are not um, doing well. Uh, this is a picture about why, what do parents themselves report about safety. Uh, 
I know I've become more concerned. This is not a picture of me or my granddaughter, certainly. Uh, but I know that I've become more concerned as a grandparent than I was as a father about throwing kids up in the air. Um, you know, they're getting little micro concussions when we throw them up in the air. Um, so safe, the safety standards may have changed a little bit. Um, but at least from the NSCAD data, we see that there are still folks who think that um, uh, pretty harsh um, parenting is still uh, a safe thing to do. So in NSCA, one of the things that we did was we asked parents to reflect on their own parenting, to tell us how they have parented using the conflict tactics scale parent to child. Uh, and I think it was in the last, uh, acts in the last month. So these are some of the uh, things that we asked them about, whether they um, had yelled, shoved, spanked, slapped the face of, or um, hit the child, grabbed the child, beat the child up, burned or scalded the child, and so on. So, um, you can think of this as, as parenting as being about well-being, or you can think about it as safety. So that's your call. But the point is that um, when you break these things down and you look at the severe violence group, that's the group at the bottom that we just saw, and I, I know we saw it quickly. Um, and we look to see how much improvement there was from when we did intake to 18 months when we back and asked them, how have you been parenting in the last month? Um, what we see is that for... Um, uh, infants and toddlers and preschoolers, um, that there was um, modest amounts of improvement in terms, I mean, so 88% or 86% report that there's none in terms of severe violence. That's a good thing. Um, but still, that's a lot of, uh, if we go back to look at these again, um, we're talking about children zero to two and then uh, three and up. Uh, and we're talking about the items in the bottom, um, through or not, child down, hit child, and so on. So 14% is, 12% um, is pretty high for toddlers. 14% um, is pretty high for preschoolers. And what's more disturbing is that you see um, the dark blue line is whether they improved from when they came into contact with child welfare services to 18 months later. The light blue triangle is whether they had gotten worse. And you can see that some are getting better and some are getting worse. But in general, there's really not any benefit uh, in terms of reducing harsh parenting by this group of parents in NSCA for very young children. Um, if you look at slightly older children, uh, you see that improvements were somewhat more common than worsening or staying the same. Uh, so the dark blue section is improving better. So uh, it seems like we're better at working with families in uh, this age group of six to 10 or 11, and up, these age groups of six to 10 or 11 and up. Um, but we still see the note at the bottom um, that, um, uh, so th that actually I, I, I will ignore, but it, it, it's about the significance testing, which shows that in terms of significance, um, a higher proportion had a decreased incidence of severe violence at 18 months. So that's, not, that's important to point out. So those, those dark blue and light blue triangles do, do indicate a significant change in the um, statistical sense. So, some improvement for this group, but not much for the young children, okay? Um, when we look at um, caregivers' reports of SEER violence and re-report, so now I'm taking those two things together. I'm saying, how many of the families that reported themselves putting the information into the laptop, uh, you know, with headphones to ask them the questions, that they had perpetrated severe violence, how many of those were actually re-reported to the Child Welfare Agency, right? So the overlap between these last two sections. Um, and <clears throat> what we see is that, um, so the, the column in the middle shows basically how many said that they had um, been involved with severe violence at 18 months. Those numbers should match up with those pies, those pieces of pie. I, I don't know if they do, but um, you can go back and look. Um, they should match up, but the right-hand column is what's important, is what proportion of that group so actually ended up with a child abuse support. And what you see is that for the zero to twos, um, the 5% that purported severe violence at 18 months, only 8% of them, 8.7% of them, had had a new child abuse report. So they were involved with these acts of burning, scalding, hitting, knocking down, and so on, um, without new child abuse reports. Uh, for the older kids, when kids start to get to the point where they can protect themselves a little bit. Oh, actually, I have a pointer here. Um, I think, 
Um, so this group in here, you start to see higher rates where, we, where they're able to either report themselves or their teachers or somebody else that's reporting. But for these young children, they continue to experience these severe outcomes and very few, you know, some of them do, and of those that do, very few of them are getting re-reported. So we have a long way to go to get um, our eyes on uh, and our reports um, communicated related to young children. Um, so many caregivers, I say, think it's many, you might say 8% is a small number, but report using severe violence toward their child following child welfare involvement. Um, a large proportion of severe violence remains unreported. Uh, youth, when we actually, this is from a different measure, but youth seven and up reported themselves on the CTS uh, what they experienced, and they confirmed these findings. And they report no decreases in violence at home following child welfare services interventions. Um, so one of the things we have to ask ourselves, and uh, we should talk about this uh, at the end of this discussion, is what do we need to do to see the children who remain at home have reduced exposure to violent parenting? Okay. Um, so this is from a different study. Um, this is from the long scan study, which has now followed children for um, some of them now for 24 years, some at, who started as infants, others who started as slightly older children. Um, they found the same thing. This was, uh, this is not a national probability study. There were sites in Chicago and, Cal and San Diego and North Carolina and Seattle and so on. Um, the median age of first referral was 8.4 months with a mean of six allegations prior to year four. So kids were having an average of six reports in the next four years, uh, more than a report a year. So are we resolving cases? No, not really. Um, are we looking for more information to tell us what else we have to do? That's part of what these re-reports do. They have a value, an information value. They help trigger decision making. I hope most of you are aware that if you've got a third or a fourth report that um, you, need to, um, you need to take every report seriously, but that, that, rises, that raises up um, the case to a, a different level in terms of what your interventions might be. And we do see that in the data. We do see that there are more, there's more likely to have cases open, to have kids placed when there are more reports. There's information value. But at the same time, for every bit of information we collect through multiple reports, we see that um, there's the, the risk of, of quite significant harm. Um, so I think that's probably all I'm going to say uh, from that slide. Um, one of the other ways to think about um, safety is to think about kids being incarcerated in juvenile services or in adult services. And why do we think that's safety? Because you know, they're not necessarily being victimized. But we do know that the world of peers who are involved with the juvenile justice system is a dangerous group uh, that when you you know, most people who victimize the community don't do that entirely alone. They do it with others, and they end up in settings where their own safety is compromised. So one of the things that uh, Melissa Johnson-Reed, who, um, like Christy, is an uh, emerging leader in this field and um, doing terrific work now at Washington University, um, she did her dissertation study on um, whether or not kids who had child abuse reports ended up in the California Youth Authority. So we matched up child abuse reports against the Youth Authority. Now the Youth Authority, I don't know if you have a Youth Authority in Wisconsin, but these are not the county ranches or county probation systems. This is what happens next, okay? So when you've, if your offense is considered so serious or your performance once you go into county care is so serious, you'll go on up to the Youth Authority and you can stay there till you're 25. Um, so it's a pretty serious level of incarceration. Um, and uh, we often hear about this, that kids who, that the prisons and the jails are filled with, um, are filled with kids who have been in the child welfare system who have been in foster care. Well, that's looking at um, the data from the endpoint working backwards. Uh, hopefully you've all had research courses that tell you that that creates certain kinds of biases uh, and that it's also very important, if you can, to look prospectively and look at kids who are moving forward uh, because many of the kids who may have uh, 
benefited from child welfare services and not ended up in the youth authority, of course, they're not in that other population. So we did a little bit of both in this project. Um, I say we because Melissa let me be her dissertation chair. Um, so about 1% of the children who have been subject, subjects of investigated child abuse reports later entered the California Youth Authority. So it's not a direct pipeline from child welfare services to the juvenile justice system. Um, and yet this 1%, because the net is so large in child welfare, uh, represented about 20% of all the children who entered the Youth Authority in those counties. So if you just looked at that population and say, you know, lots of kids who are in child welfare and juvenile services. It's true, but in another way, it, it's not the predominant path that goes from child welfare services into juvenile uh, services. Um, among African American youth investigated for abuse and neglect, as many as 15% of all the 17 year olds entered the youth authority. Um, and in general, the likelihood of entering the youth authority is elevated for kids who've been involved with child welfare over kids in the general population who may victimize someone and end up in the youth authority but never were involved with child welfare services. Um, and this is where the connection gets a little complicated but more interesting with regard to child abuse and juvenile services. So entries were concentrated among children with more than one report of maltreatment, so it was these kids with multiple reports of maltreatment. 70% um, of children who eventually entered the youth authority did so after two or more reports, uh, and most entered between three and four years after their first investigation. So. Uh, these were kids who were served two or three times or four times and went through a period of um, maybe service receipt on and off and then ended up in the youth authority. Um, children of color, primarily African American children at that time, were about two times less likely to become incarcerated than children, oh sorry, children of color who received ongoing services, okay? So we actually looked not just to see how many reports they had, but did they get services? And uh, this effect did not hold for white kids, not sure why, but for African American kids, if their families did get child welfare services, it reduced their likelihood of subsequent incarceration about two times. It was a significant reduction. So there was some benefit there. Um, and that's a very important thing. So reporting um, doesn't do much, but services can. And for some populations at least, this population at this time, and especially in the African American community, uh, it diverted them from the youth authority. Now, we know states that, like Washington State, that um, is, building, uh, is building adult prisons, and then they started a whole initiative around preventing kids going into the correctional facilities um, by using uh, an evidence-based intervention called multisystemic therapy, uh, MST. And so they've reduced their prison building because they feel like they're getting such a good benefit in Cases just like this, kids who had a history, they were moving forward, it looked like they were gonna end up in an adult correctional facility and through family-based interventions, not child welfare per se, but MST, uh, they feel like they're getting enough reduction in the need for correctional services that they were able to reduce their prison building. We might be able to make the same case here. But I need to note that um, Joe Ryan, who, um, was at Illinois and has now moved to Michigan, but has done studies in a variety of different places around the country, uh, in, in LA and in, um, uh, in Washington State. Um, he has some contrary findings in Illinois. Um, he concluded there that children involved with child welfare services had actually elevated rates of juvenile justice involvement uh, when he compared them to uh, kids who had not. But he was looking particularly at kids who were in group care, um, looking at uh, whether they were in group care or in other kinds of placements, and found that the ones who had been in group care, um, even when he tried to control for selection into group care, right, you have to worry about, so, so he found that the kids who had been in group care were more likely to go on into um, the juvenile justice system if they had been in child welfare group care first. Now, the first question you should ask, well, are the kids who are in child welfare group care really that similar to the kids who are in child welfare not in group care? Um, and Joe tried to control for some of that and how well he did that, I don't know. But my point is this is not totally settled what the impact of child welfare services is and juvenile services, but I think it's a great opportunity, an enormous opportunity to look at this because everybody knows whether they're worried about childhood trauma or not, they're definitely worried about kids going to the juvenile justice system. Um, they're worried for their own sakes, they're worried they know about the costs, they're worried about the careers, uh, 
So it's a, it's a great opportunity. Uh, I know that Wisconsin, from my meeting yesterday, um, the department is thinking about how to better serve kids in both systems. Uh, and there are a lot of other people around the country who are thinking the same things. Um, in Maryland, we're now combining our juvenile justice and child welfare data so we can see which kids are starting in one system and going to the other. Uh, we can, we're hoping to be able to figure out pretty soon which kids in the juvenile justice system already have younger siblings who are under child protection, so maybe we can intervene in those families a little more seriously, strenuously, effectively, however you might want to think about it. So this is a big area um, that I hope some of you will take up. Um, so from those Maryland data, a couple of other um, uh, things that we found, 30 to 70 percent of the young people in the Department of Juvenile Services have previously been involved with child welfare services. So it's a um, robust enough path, a plentiful enough path to really make it worthwhile. Um, one percent of all the black youth in Maryland have DJS involvement by the time they turn 14. So um, high rates, even uh, two high rates, I should say, even for kids before they're teenagers. Um, and um, another study that was done uh, in Allegheny County, uh, where Pittsburgh is, that 20% of children who entered child welfare service placement will later enter Department of Juvenile Services. And this is a, um, a point that I will come back to around placement stability. Uh, it's also hard to know exactly where to put placement stability, whether it's permanency, well-being, or safety. But wherever you put it, it's a keen issue and one that, again, I think is a great opportunity for, uh, for child welfare is to reduce placement instability. In this Pittsburgh study, um, or study that comes out of Pittsburgh, I don't really remember the source of the data, um, each additional placement that kids had increased the likelihood of subsequent juvenile justice involvement by 11%. Um, it wasn't how long kids stayed in care. It was how many placements they had in care. So if they had been in care for two, three, four, five years, actually staying in care longer had a benefit in terms of reducing juvenile justice involvement if it was stable care. But if the kids were moving constantly, then that benefit not only was um, lost, uh, but it was overturned so that basically the kids with unstable care were much more likely to go into juvenile services. How do we, how do we improve the stability of care uh, for our kids? Uh, I'll talk about that a bit more because you'll see that Instability of care has an impact in, in many other ways as well. Whoa, why did I think anyone would be able to read that? Um, so um, this must have been one of those times when I got a call about some from the president saying, uh, you need to tighten this up. And I said, OK, I'll get on it, and got, forgot to get back to this slide. Um, but um, basically, what this is, and I could tell it to you, and we have better pictures. Maybe I'll just go ahead to the, should I go ahead to the pictures? No, I won't. Um, this is a very interesting set of studies now being done by Emily Putnam Hornstein, another name that you should remember. Um, Emily is a graduate of Berkeley and worked in the, um, proud to say, in the Child Welfare Research Center that um, Mark Courtney and Barbara Needell and myself and Jill Barrick have been involved with over the years. She's now at USC. And what she's been able to do is she's been able to take child abuse data, mortality data, and child welfare data and put them together into one big data set. So she has 1.2 million births of kids in California, and then she follows them to see, did they get child welfare services, and were they still alive five years later? Okay, So that's basically what's in these notes. Um, and uh, what they say is that, and then she looked at it by, um, she looked at it by ethnicity, OK? Um, and what she finds, so you can see the, the um, different groups. She had four ethnic groups, white, Hispanic, black, and Asian Pacific Islander. Um, and all the scales are the same. That's one of the things you want to check out. And um, the solid line is the um, maltreatment substantiation, OK? Maltreatment substantiation rate. So how many kids from this um, ethnic group have a report where the maltreatment is substantiated, okay? So that's, and that's the rate. And the other, the dotted line is the injury death rate, okay? Um, so what you see in these lines is that um, for Asian Pacific, let's start with uh, Asian Pacific Islanders. 
because this was her comparison group. They have a low rate of um, involvement with child welfare services, um, and they have a low rate of, um, of mortality. Uh, but the two things are going together uh, for the most part. So kids who are in high-risk situations are getting some child welfare services in a significant amount, but they also are experiencing mortality. Um, the, of course, the child welfare reports and the mortality rates are, um, or the more, yes, they're, the child welfare rates and the mortality rates are on different scales. One's per 10,000, one's for 100,000. Mortality is still a pretty rare event, but you have a state as large as California, you can start to study these things. Um, so for African American kids, um, it looks differently. Um, you have um, a high rate of um, injury deaths, uh, and you have um, a pretty disparate rate of substantiations. So there's quite a bit of difference between them, um, although there's certainly some parallel. For white kids, um, you have a, um, as, as you move towards the end, you have a higher maltreatment rate. More kids are being investigated than are, comparatively, than are experiencing mortality, right? Um, so that's how those things look. And statistically, um, what you see is that black children were identified as substantiated victims of maltreatment at significantly higher rates uh, than white children for each age group. But as you go forward, what you see is that she computed something else called excess injury deaths in California. And these are basically deaths of children by race where there was no child welfare investigation or uh, substantiation. And what you see from this then is that although African American kids are involved quite a bit in child welfare, their rates were higher than white kids, when you compare that to their mortality rate, their accidental mortality rate, they actually have a significantly higher rate overall. So Emily's analysis in calling these things excess injury deaths is that uh, if you use the Asian Pacific Islanders as the comparison group, any death rate over 8.2 per 100,000, she calls excess injury deaths. And her assumption is that they should, those, um, that there should have been more child welfare involvement in cases uh, to try to prevent some of those deaths. And what she, do, what she doesn't find in her, her data is um, that that's the case, and that for black and Native American kids, they have a very high um, excess death rate beyond what, what could be expected. So this is where um, she actually then plots these um, excess death rates uh, for the, um, by race and by age, so younger than four, um, and, or, or um, excess death defined as more than four injury deaths per 100,000, and then more than six and more than eight. Um, and what you see in this is that for each white or Hispanic death in excess of the 8.2 baseline, there were um, about 340 to 350 substantiated cases of maltreatment. Uh, whereas for, white, for African American kids, there are only about 218 uh, cases of substantiated maltreatment. So more deaths, less child welfare involvement. Um, in summary, really across these studies, um, young children are more likely to die from child maltreatment overall, um, and that we continue to underserve children, uh, especially, it appears, African American children, who both from the Johnson Reed study and the Putnam Hornstein study, um, either die or incarcerated at rates higher than other children. So this is controversial, of course. Um, these, these, these are fairly new studies that have come out. There hasn't been a you know, significant critique of them. Um, they've, I don't think Emily, Emily was clearly trying to understand disproportionality in doing this work uh, because the research group that she's in, Barbara Needell is the PI, has been very focused on uh, on disproportionality. They've written some technical articles about how do you assess disproportionality and so on. Um, so again, it would uh, be great to see this from other states. It would be great to see additional analyses of this. But I think 
the way that the field is trying to move is, and Brett Drake at Wash U is also doing this, is to try to find pretty hard indicators of things, um, not just the perception that someone's harmed and that they need an investigation, but some really hard measurable outcomes to better understand whether we're underserving or uh, overserving kids who are, um, especially kids of color and especially African American kids. Uh, the debate should also be about Native American kids because they also have high risks, but it hasn't really focused on that. It's mostly been about African American kids. So um, I think there's a paper that Brett Drake is the lead on in pediatrics that also discusses this with regard to other uh, risk outcomes for, for kids of color. And I think those papers and the NIST-4 are um, starting to make it very hard to make the case that this is mostly about cultural competence and perception. Uh, it sounds like it seems more and more like it's about real, genuine safety and well-being risks. Okay. Um, I'm not going to take you through this one. I probably said enough about it, but this was another study that looked at death rates of kids in foster care. Um, and um, it basically shows a bit of the same thing. This is probably the best slide. Uh, when we looked at preventable deaths of kids who had been in foster care and then um, had um, uh, either were in foster care, the first set of three bars, had been in foster care, or were in the general population, and we look at Caucasians, for example, we see that foster children have lower mortality rates than kids who have been discharged from foster care, uh, and foster children have lower mortality rates than, uh, than kids, uh, sorry, in the, the blue bars, yeah, they have lower mortality rates, but that they, both of those rates are higher than kids in the general population. The general population of kids, of white kids who are not in foster care is, um, is less prone to um, uh, preventable death. Uh, for African American kids, though, it's different. Um, the foster kids uh, are having much lower um, preventable deaths than the kids who have left foster care. Um, and actually, the kids in foster care have less preventable deaths than the kids who are in the general population. Uh, for Hispanic kids, uh, it's, a bit, it's more like white kids that the foster care and non-foster care populations are more similar and the general population is lower. So once again, it's um, uh, part, of the, part of the picture and, and I don't want to spend a lot more time on it. Um, one of the things that, and this is new work that um, Mary Hadarowitz, who was a, a Title IV-E student uh, and I worked on when she was in graduate school and, and continued to work on some while she was out working in the Child Welfare Agency and um, she kept writing back and saying, do you have any more research for me to do? So we worked on this and pleased to say she's now a second year PhD student. But one of the things we wanted to look at because we became so concerned, she was working in an adoption unit in New Jersey where there was a, quite a catastrophic event of um, adoptive parents um, uh, killing a, one of their adopted children. They had both other adopted children and biological children and this child, child got sort of singled out. Um, and ended up being killed was why is that happening? Um, if we're really trying to make the case that we have a good selection process and we are the safe alternative to being at home, how can we tolerate even a few deaths in foster care and adoption? And yet we don't have good data on this. Um, I hope for those of you who are um, on the younger side of life than I am, that in your time you will make sure that we collect, um, it, many of you have read Child Maltreatment, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services annual report on uh, outcomes for children, child abuse reports, how they're disposed and so on. There's a part in there about um, child uh, abuse deaths and they also do some work around kids who are under the supervision of the department when they die. And that's how we think about this. So we don't really go and look, for example, at adopted families, um, the fatalities in adoptive families. We don't really spend much time looking at fatalities in foster care either. Um, and so there's no good data about this. So what Mary and I had to do uh, was to basically go to public sources, try to get reports from states, 
try to get newspaper articles, and just get a better understanding of what's going on that we're having these fatalities. Uh, Texas, uh, some of you probably get child welfare services in the news. To, some of you get that um, email every morning that tells you what's going on around newspapers. It's a dangerous way to do science, I'm the first to admit, um, but sometimes that's all you've got. Uh, there was just a report yesterday about nine deaths in foster care in Texas that they were um, investigating. So um, we became a little concerned, wrote a paper about this, had a little trouble getting it published. Maybe it was the methods, maybe it was the message, not sure. Uh, it ended up being published in Adoption Quarterly. Um, and it's just really important to think about whether foster care and adoptive care, which were once considered the safest place that kids could be, um, safer than residential care, safer than home, uh, are still as safe as they used to be. Um, they may still be, but I would like to see more evidence to prove that. Uh, we continue to see reports of fatalities, and um, we um, started to look a bit through these reports to try to categorize them and try to see what's going on with these deaths. So one of the things we learned, for example, is that, um, and this is sort of gruesome, that the kids who die in foster care and adoption it makes sense, but it's also tough news, are older, are harder to kill, basically, than the children who die in the general population. So the kids who die in the general population tend to be quite young. They die sometimes, if they're murdered, from suffocation, if they die from accidents, and so on. These older kids that are getting killed in foster care adoption are often getting starved. They're getting, having very terrible um, uh, outcomes and, um, and processes as they, uh, as they experience that. So. Um, I don't know exactly what, you know, what the intervention is, um, but there are some ideas that I certainly have. One of the cases in Maryland, uh, there were three kids in a family. Um, two of them were murdered, and the adoptive mother who was having a mental health meltdown had lost her job, was moving a lot, put them in a freezer. Uh, the other one who's five years old, eventually ran away and managed to get on a city bus and escape. Um, so what did we miss? One of the things we missed was this mother was moved five times in the year before she killed her children. Now, in your agency, are you looking at your adoption records to see whether people are moving a lot? And if so, are you sending somebody out or calling them or finding out what's going on, what's happening that you move five times? Um, uh, some of these situations have been ones where the um, adoptive parents have asked for subsidy. Uh, they, they keep asking to have the subsidy increase because the kids are getting harder and requiring more services. Um, at some point, are you connecting the people who are making the subsidy decisions to any kind of behavioral health team that might go out or talk with them or figure out why are things getting so much harder and is money really the answer to this? Maybe you do that. If you do, that's great, but if not, those are things that we need to be thinking about. Sometimes we have this information in our agencies, but we don't even know that we have it, and I think it's time that we start to really activate it. One good thing that came up in the latest federal legislation is that foster and adoptive parents at least have to provide some information that indicates that they have the child and the child is going to school. So having kids in freezers um, you know, in the future would not be, uh, hopefully would be detected, you never know. Uh, there are lots of ways around things, but I think the federal government's getting more concerned. I think we all need to be getting somewhat more concerned. One of the things that we came up with in this review that we have asked to be added to the SAFE home study, which is the home study that is used at least in much of Wisconsin, certainly in Milwaukee and, and some of the other counties, uh, is that there's a finding that if you have um, had a history, this is in the general population, in filicides in general when parents kill their kids, that a history of having been in juvenile hall or juvenile justice system is a, a red flag uh, for violence against your children. Now, red flags may not explain a lot. You know, a red flag is not a sure sign that you're going to do something. But if we build into the home study some of these red flags for higher risk behavior and we <coughs> ask families about them, and we really have a serious discussion about what that means, and we look through that lens a little bit more, we may also be a little more sensitive to these things. Um, so I think that's basically what this slide says. Um, 
So conclusions on this part of the safety discussion um, is that um, safety for children involved with child welfare is routinely compromised, even, even for and perhaps especially for younger children. Uh, tragically serious outcomes, including higher mortality rates and perhaps more juvenile services, although that's a little unclear, are evident with under service. Um, and that these, uh, these ongoing risks are not the exception. They are not that rare. And um, it's really going to be important for us to double back and not just be thinking that we've solved the safety problem. Uh, we still have a major safety, um, we have some major safety accomplishments ahead of us in child welfare services. Let me just stop there for a second and see if you want me to go back to any slide and explain it better or if people have comments or if any of you wrote down that question that I mentioned before and want to talk about it. I didn't, but I could go back and find it. Um, it had to do with how do we get eyes on younger children to make sure that even though they're experiencing this very harsh parenting, um, that we are able to help families to provide more responsive parenting um, and less um, severe parenting. But you don't have to answer that. You might have a question. Yes. A question. Thank you. You make me feel like a professor. Make sure I understand what you said. Did you say that the data kind of bears out in terms of service to African American families, that there may actually be a need that is not necessarily a reflection of disproportionality in terms of screening? Absolutely. So I think, um, I think the NIS, uh, the, the Brett Drake paper in pediatrics maybe 2011 or 12, um, provides the best description of that. It takes into account the NIST 1, 2, 3, and 4, the National Incident Study data. The NIST 3 was used a lot to say there's no real difference in terms of child abuse in African American and white families. And then, therefore, if there's no real difference, why should there be a difference in the prevalence where we see so many more kids getting served and so many more kids in foster care. And Brett does a really nice job of going through and saying there was a difference, but because the sample was small, it wasn't statistically significant, but not showing that two things are not statistically significantly different is not the same as saying they're the same. And we've been miscommunicating about that. And NIST 4, the sample size went up, the precision of measurement was better because they used some better techniques. And then it becomes quite clear that the prevalence rates are higher in the African American community. So I didn't really spend a lot of time talking about that. What I was talking about was that the mortality rates are higher, according to Emily Putnam Hornstein's. I think you'll find it to be quite impressive research. Um, and that there's less convincing evidence, but there is also some evidence that underservice may also lead to kids in the African American community going into juvenile services. So, it's almost always the case that um, there's sometimes going to be some underservice and sometimes some overservice. Overservice meaning service that didn't need to be provided, but it was provided because of some reason like bias or um, other kinds of system factors. Uh, but on balance, there's absolutely no question in my mind uh, that um, the preponderance of misservice, if you will, especially for African-American kids and families, is underservice. Uh, and there's now a growing number of studies, I think, that show that for different issues in the child welfare service, from reporting now to preventing death and, um, and transitions to juvenile services. Christy. Yeah, I, I just want to add, I think you know, part of the reason this um, is such a tough topic to talk about is that there's, there's two camps of people that believe very different things. You know, there's, there's a group of people that believes that disproportionality is all about uh, cultural incompetence and bias and discrimination. And then there's a group of people that think, well, there's different levels of risk factors in different demographic segments of the population. And depending on what you believe, very different response you know, to, to give, to try to correct the problem of disproportionality. Either way, it's a problem, but the solution is very different depending on the camp you're in. And so the preponderance of evidence is suggesting it's really about differences in risk factors. Not to mean that there's no discrimination or bias, but that, you know, what's, what's mostly driving them is difference in risk factors. That's a very different solution to be looking at. Yeah, it is. And, and I think, um, 
And there was a period where it was sort of ambiguous. I, I think the ambiguity is um, pretty much gone. But um, then I'm known for that position. So uh, you know, don't stop talking with me. But I will say that even my close friend and colleague and former research assistant and PhD student, Barbara Needell, um, who sat for many years on the uh, work group on uh, the Coalition on Racism and Child Welfare, or whatever it was called, that the Center for the Study of Social Policy um, put together to address this issue th through combined funding from Annie Casey Foundation, Casey Family Programs, and Jim Casey Youth Opportunities, um, that even Barbara has, after working with Emily on, these, on this study, um, even she has changed her view about this and has a much different perspective about it. Um, so we all like to think we're ahead of the curve. Um, I think that the times are changing. Yes? Um, the bar graph that you showed us before, yeah. mm -hmm. can I see that again? Sure. Yeah, that's... Uh, it was, I was just wondering where... This one? Yeah. yeah. Which study um, is that from? Oh, a little bit more. This is a California study. So what we did in California was we um, uh, matched up birth certificates and foster care cases. And then when we thought that a child had died in foster care, there are a lot of deaths for young children in foster care because to some extent foster care in California and other places is like, a nurse, it's like nursing home care for young children. So in those days we had some kids who were still dying from HIV, but that was a small relatively small group who are in foster care, group care. But there are other kids who go into medical foster care and so on. So for the young children, the effects weren't that dramatic. But for the older children, they were quite dramatic. So yeah, this is a California study. Um, it's uh, Barth and Blackwell. Um, uh, Dr. Blackwell is a um, graduate of the geography program at University of California, Berkeley. And um, so she was... Um, did a lot of these analyses, but we actually called and followed up on virtually every one of the every one of the foster care deaths to make sure that our data was correct. Um, the kids who were not in foster care, of course, that's a little more challenging. But we used um, uh, uh, matching and close matching, not probabilistic matching, but um, really tight matching to make sure that they were the same kids. Okay, um, permanency and continuity. Um, so um, one of the things that I did want to talk about, again, is this issue of placement instability. And I think it's just showing itself to be a, a huge factor in child welfare services. And it's not an easy one to master. Uh, one of the studies that I worked on some years ago, also with Barbara and um, Jill Barbany Dell and Jill Barrick is in a book called The Tender Years, uh, still one of the things I'm proudest of. And we wrote a whole book about um, child welfare for little kids. And um, one of the analyses we did there was we tried to look at the number of placement moves that little kids had in foster care. And what we were seeing in California was that foster parents were going in and telling judges, oh, you can't move this child because we're bonded. Um, and then what we would see when we'd follow, and so the judges would agree, and they'd say, well, aren't you going to adopt the child? Well, I'm really not in a position to adopt the child, but you can't move this child because I'm bonded. Uh, we're bonded. And so they'd say, OK, well, being bonded, not my favorite term. Um, to me, being bonded is something that has to do with glue and jail and furniture. Um, not people, uh, and chicks, um, not people. But um, maybe they were trying to say we have an important relationship that if we you know, pulled this relationship apart, it would be traumatic for the child. Um, in any event, uh, when we followed the kids over six years using administrative data, we saw they weren't all that bonded because when those kids were six years old, something like 30% of them had five or more placements. Five placements when you're six years old, imagine. Um, not knowing in any given year whether the person who took you out trick-or-treating or who you celebrated the holidays with or uh, you, you know, kissed goodnight was going to be the person you would see uh, a month later. Uh, and it was one of the reasons um, Peter Degree from LA County picked this up and took some of our charts back to Senate hearings 
that led to the passage of the Adoption Safe Families Act, which basically said, no, we're not going to accept long-term foster care, that long-term foster care is just as stable and as good as anything else, and you don't really have to do anything more than that, because we showed even for little kids, we said, we know it's not true for the older kids that they stay in one place, but even for the little kids, they weren't staying in one place. So placement and stability, the other thing about that is that there's a great study by Ray Newton uh, from um, Children's Hospital in San Diego and John Landsberg and that very talented group uh, where they basically looked at a whole group of kids. This was from the long scan study, so it's a little dated, but a whole group of kids who came into foster care who had normal child behavior checklist scores, okay? So they didn't have behavior problems. And then they looked to see how many times they moved and they saw that their behavior problems got worse and worse and worse. And it was a nice design to untangle this issue of, well, placement instability is really about kids with really hard problems. And of course they have hard problems at the end because they had hard problems at the beginning because they wouldn't have moved if they didn't have hard problems. Uh, well, no, Ray Newton's study showed, and that's why longitudinal research is so helpful, showed pretty clearly that the hard problems were emerging as the kids moved. And um, this uh, Pitt study has found, that I referenced before, has found a similar thing. Um, also showing that mental health problems may be a stronger predictor of juvenile services than child welfare involvement, and I talked about that. So I don't have as much content on this as I probably should, given how important it is, um, but I want to tell you about a couple of things, uh, some of which I talked about yesterday with the department, is that in Australia, they have a, um, it's in uh, Melbourne, they have a very interesting model there where they've taken a group of beha basically behavioral specialists who work with, have worked with families with kids with developmental disabilities and autism and a lot of other very knotty problems, and they've assigned them to work as sort of a, uh, I don't want to call them a SWAT team, but a specialized team that goes in and helps families when they start to see that, uh, when they start to call and say, I'm not sure I can handle this kid anymore. So um, they've kind of taken it outside of child welfare, for better and for worse. They say, we have skilled people, and I know Wisconsin and the University of uh, Wisconsin and Madison has an incredible reputation for having worked over the years to help families with very difficult challenges with regard to behavior. Um, so they developed specialized units outside the child welfare system with small caseloads to do this work. Um, another program which I like very much is called KEEP. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of KEEP? Have you read anything about it in school? Okay, well, if nothing else, my trip is worthwhile if I can get a few of you to read about KEEP. So KEEP is um, multidimensional treatment foster care light. Any of you heard of multidimensional treatment foster care? Ah, more hands go up. Okay, so um, this is Patty Chamberlain's model is called multidimensional treatment foster care. Patty Chamberlain is the um, conceptual goddaughter of Jerry Patterson who basically developed a whole set of parent management training programs related to reducing coercive interactions between parents and children. And um, one of the things that Patty did her dissertation on was something called the parent daily report where instead of waiting for parents to call you because they're in crisis, you call them. Isn't that a great idea? Um, and you call them if they have hard enough kids every day. And you say, let's run through this list of problems. Did you have these problems today? And, um, and then you talk a little bit about it. And then you make note of it. And then when you do your foster parent support group, which happens every week, so I'm not saying these are things that are easy to put into a child welfare system, but it happens every week. Then you talk about those problems there in addition to whatever your curriculum was. But what they've been able to do is to, to demonstrate over time that if, if you can reduce those daily reports by foster parents from around eight or nine, which is the high risk area, to five or six a day, okay? So we're not saying these are perfect, sweet relationships every day between parents and children. But if parents only indicate that they have four or five problems rather than eight or nine, it has a geometric different impact on um, whether or not they end up uh, asking for that kid to be removed, having placement instability. So multidimensional treatment foster care has been doing this now for 15 years in about five countries with kids in group homes who had been in group homes but are in treatment foster care. They have one kid in the home at a time. They have um, highly trained foster parents. 
they have family therapy, they have um, mentoring for the youth, they have individual therapy, and they have parent daily report, daily report. Keep, but, but Patty has had trouble replicating this, even though wherever they've replicated, it's done very well. So England has recently completed a trial and they've had great results. So it's a good, robust model. They're doing it now in New York City and a lot of other places. But it's expensive. How many agencies can have foster care with one kid in there at a time? Uh, what do you do with siblings? There are a whole bunch of other issues. So Patty has um, come up with multidimensional treatment foster care light, uh, piloted in San Diego County, a very diverse uh, county, uh, with 600 families, kids in kinship care, um, kids in um, conventional foster care, without any real specialized setups, families where there's two or three or four or five kids, like most of our foster families have. So really took away all the specialized conditions and said, how do we do this? So I, I mentioned Patty, but actually Joe Price is one of the, uh, I think has been the PI on a lot of this. Um, Patty, John Lanswork, if you Google any of their names, um, you'll find the work on KEEP. And they've had very good results. The foster parents, so it, they meet once a week, they don't have the family therapy, they don't have the individual therapy, they have parent weekly report, not daily report. Uh, the sessions are about, six, the total is 16 weeks, uh, and they've lowered the restrictions on how many kids you can have in the family and so on. And they've had very good re uh, outcomes on placement stability. Um, there's a great article about it in Prevention Science, uh, several other articles about it. So good results in an RCT in reducing placement stability. Also getting more kids into permanency. So it's easier to get kids adopted if their problem you know, reports are not eight or nine a day, right? If they're two or three or four or five. So um, there are some kids that they're not able to help. They're not saying they can help everybody. But on average, it's been a very good intervention. We have used it in Maryland, and we've had quite a bit of success. We still haven't gotten our results written up, but we've had quite a bit of success in reducing placement instability. The foster parents really like it. And it's based on a few things. I asked Patty one time when she was in Maryland, I said, Patty, it's pretty stripped down in terms of the messaging. Um, I said, if there was one thing you wanted families to get, what would it be? And she said, um, the most important thing in all of KEEP is uh, that you should say four positive things to your kid for every one suggestion for improvement. And uh, so it's a very positive curriculum. And the way they do the group work, this is, it's interesting. I, I think of it as a Sheldon Rose model. Patty had never heard of Sheldon Rose. And some of you may have never heard of Sheldon Rose. But Sheldon Rose, has, Rose had a huge impact on the field. And basically doing behavioral group work where you're not only teaching the, um, in this case, foster parents to be positive, to catch people doing good, to um, anticipate problems, to do all the good behavioral things. But you're modeling that all the time with the members of the group. So you're using behavioral methods with your, the foster parents. You're paying attention to the foster parents who are really talking serious about problem solving rather than the ones that are complaining. Uh, you're really encouraging any sign that you see from anybody that they're using the right skills. So it's a really nice model. Um, it made me think of Sheldon. Okay. Um, outcomes of independent living. Uh, and, I, and I don't know whether I have, I do have a reference list. It might have some of the keep stuff in there, but it won't be that hard to find. Um, outcomes of independent living. This is a really thorny one. Uh, if I asked you what happens to kids who leave independent living, what would you tell me? What would some of the words that would come to your mind? What are their highest most probable outcomes? Incarceration, okay. Homelessness, uh huh. What was that? Poverty, okay. Mental health problems. You might, so that's the impression we have left, isn't it? Um, is that the right impression? Um, that's a really good question. And I think it's really important to um, be thinking about whether or not those are, that's the typical outcome. Uh, I noticed you could have said they return to their families and they struggle with that, but some of them really work through it and they're just like any other poor kids. That does happen to a substantial population of kids who leave foster care. Um, 
but we often don't think about that. Um, it's also really important to note that the Midwest study um, that Mark Courtney headed up um, was done a few years ago. Um, it was done before it was influential in leading to the passage of um, new legislation to better support kids who are in foster care and to allow them in many states now, I understand not yet in Wisconsin, to remain in foster care till they're 21. Um, and that is um, changing the face of foster care to a certain extent. Uh, we cert I certainly see that around the country. One of the things I see is an enormous growth in the number of foster kids going to college. Uh, I don't know whether, do you have a special program here for foster youth who are at Madison? Do you know? No one's saying, no, one's, no one knows it at this point. So many schools, even Berkeley, it's hard, almost as hard to get into as Madison. Um, even Berkeley now has a special dorm. They have, they have a law in California that every university has to have a dorm that's open during holidays and the summer for former foster youth. Because where do they go uh, if the dorms close, right? Um, States are doing more and more policies like that, paying for scholarships, setting up programs for former foster youth. Uh, Jill Barrick has done some wonderful work at Berkeley about that. Western Michigan has a well-known program. Um, there are more and more efforts to try to help foster youth uh, to make it into college and to get through college. So that's now become a routine part of independent living programs is to do some orientation to college, make sure the kids in independent living programs have at least fill out applications. Uh, so there are a lot of different things that are starting to change the face of what happens when kids leave foster care. And unfortunately, we don't have new studies yet that are picking that up. Um, at the same time, I think it's reasonable to say that the conventional independent living programs, which were not in the field when I started, um, the first study I did in this area was in 1986, and there were a few sheltered housing programs and things like that, but there's almost no regular independent living programs. Um, and uh, that, for the most part, they have not shown much impact. Mark Courtney has done three randomized clinical trials where he's tried to look at the best independent living programs that he could find in the country um, and is finding very little impact. Um, one of the studies, though, that he's also working on with a place called Youth Villages in Tennessee and with partnership from uh, the famous MDRC, which is a research firm that um, does randomized um, clinical trials in the human services, is that they've come up with a more intensive model rather than edu more, more of a curriculum-based education model. It's a model based on multisystemic um, therapy. So, uh, Youth Villages has been a long time multi-systemic therapy provider. They have another version of that called Intercept and they created a special, that's usually a family focused intervention for those of you who know MST from the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, they came up with this kind of a modified version for kids who are older, trying to work with their families in a slightly different way, but really intensive case management. Uh, and you know, for a six month to a one year period around the transition out of care. And um, apparently, again, this isn't released, but apparently they're having quite good results. So uh, I guess my point there is that that's something that we probably ought to be thinking about. Though I don't know how good you are all at your bookkeeping, but I could never keep my checkbook balanced until um, I got to be an assistant professor and actually had a real salary. Um, and still, my wife does all that stuff, and I'm hopeless at it. Um, kids, teaching kids to bounce their checkbooks when they have no income, and they have bounced a few checks, and their banks have kicked them out, and a few other things like that, is not enough. You need somebody who can actually go in and puzzle with them, and go to the bank, and figure out how to get the new account open, and you know, work with getting, helping them to get jobs, and find other people they can connect to, and so on. So, uh, I guess that's one of my lessons. Not that some of those skills that we teach in independent living aren't helpful, but um, it's just got to be a lot more. So I realized as I was um, lying around, luxuriating in all the free time I had this morning that I don't usually get as a dean, that I had forgotten a slide. Um, I forgot to say anything about guardianship. And actually, we know a lot more about guardianship than 
now than we used to know. And the reason we know more about it is because of Mark Testa. Um, and Mark is a very important figure in the field. Uh, he had a, one of these great joint appointments for many years between the university and working for the Department of Children and Family Services in the state of Illinois. And he could get all kinds of things done from those two perches. And the one thing that he did that I hope you've read about by now is he did a big randomized trial in Illinois to look and see what happens if you pay people to become guardians. As you know, we pay foster parents, and we've always paid foster parents. Starting in around 1978, um, we started paying adoption subsidies. So for the last 30 years, we've paid adoptive parents some amount of money to care for kids. But we've never helped guardians. When they took guardianship, they basically took it on for themselves. Uh, but that was something that Mark was concerned about, and they studied in Illinois. And the way they were able to do a randomized clinical trial is they let 95% of the population of people who wanted to go into guardianship go into guardianship in 95% of the areas in the state. And for 5%, they had a control group where you couldn't go into paid guardianship. To go into paid guardianship, you had to pass a certain screen. You had to have had a child in your home for more than two years. Uh, you had to basically have a relationship with a child that was stable um, and where you could have possibly adopted if you wanted to, uh, but uh, where you made a decision for, and there's sometimes good reasons for these things, to decide to do guardianship. So one of the theories, and I think I've been a proponent of this myself, um, although I have sort of selective memory now about all the things that I predicted that were wrong, was that um, guardianship would be um, not permanent enough, not legal enough. When kids turn 15 uh, and they stole the car, um, that an adoptive parent would just take them back and the guardian would say, to hell with it, that's enough. Um, and so it was really important to have these be adoptions and not guardianships, um, and that they would disrupt over time if you didn't have that extra legal oomph. Um, but Mark has shown that uh, these guardianship outcomes are quite robust, that the families are staying together just as much or almost just as much as the adoptive families, very s slight differences. So has really lifted up guardianship. And here's another great example of a social worker thinking from the practice side up um, showing that you can have an impact, actually saving a lot of money, um, and because kids weren't going into other outcomes, um, like group homes or treatment foster homes, they were staying in guardianships, and, um, and getting this passed as part of the most recent um, federal uh, child welfare reforms. So good news for guardianship. Again, none of this is the final word, but right now I think if you read his papers, he's got a very nice paper in um, uh, The Future of Children, the journal that um, Princeton and Brookings manages, which is a great journal. And he's got some other, um, he's got some other papers that look at these data and, and describe them in more detail. OK. Outcomes of adoption. Um, this one's a little easier. Nothing simple in our field. That's what makes it so fascinating. Um, the first child welfare study I ever did was when I first got to Berkeley in 1982. And there was a request for research proposals from the federal government because in 1980, they had passed the Adoption Assistance and Child Welfare Act. And everybody was saying, oh my god, we're going to place all these adopted children. And they're going to disrupt all over the place. Um, we're placing these older kids. Older than three was meant older in those days. Uh, and it's never going to work. We need to study this. So the Children's Bureau funded three studies at that time, and I was fortunate that one of them was uh, a California study, and we found that across these three studies, using different methods in different parts of the country, that the disruption rate was somewhere on average um, between 10 and 14 percent. When the Adoption Safe Families Act was place. So that was lower than people thought. Of course, it's graded by age. If a child comes into your home older, it gets closer to 40 percent. If the child comes in younger, it's closer to under 10 percent. Um, but it was pretty consistent. When um, 
the Adoption, the Adoption Assistance Child Welfare Act gave way to the Adoption Safe Families Act in 1996. The same cry came up, oh my God, now we're adopting all these older, older, older kids, and after short times instead, you know, in care, and um, we need to look at this again, we're having all these disruptions. And um, I did not get involved in those studies, but a very good study done in Illinois, two good studies done in Illinois, um, using the same data, so they overlap a bit, but slightly different methods, showed that they actually hadn't gotten worse, that the disruption rate was no higher, and that um, it still was in there around one out of seven, one out of eight kids was um, gonna experience a disruption after adoption. Disruption being defined in this case um, as being someone who was expected to be adopted or had been adopted and then the adoption didn't last, okay? So there's a broader way to define this and that's what I've been trying to talk with people about more recently, um, which is basically what I would just call a difficult adoption. Uh, so if you think about adoptions that have kids who have been placed by their parents into residential care or wilderness programs or have run away um, or have gone to live with another family member um, and perhaps even, we don't have data on this, but God forbid some of the kinds of um, replacements of kids that Reuters was writing about a, a couple of months ago where kids were being shipped off to whole other families. Uh, I think that's less common in public adoptions than in international adoptions. But there is a whole nother ring around these adoptions that we hear about, and that's why people are so concerned. Uh, I don't think those are turning into legal disruptions. I think for the most part, those families still have legal custody over their children. But it is a big concern that that number might get us up to more like 40%. Uh, if you took other displacements, other difficulties. Um, if you took mental health service use and family therapy and other indicators that people were struggling, it, it would probably exceed 50%. It is a hard path uh, for a lot of families and we aren't necessarily telling them all of that. Um, so I think it's important that we do tell them that, uh, that disclosure is important. But um, for the most part, adoptions that are created by child welfare agencies our lifetime, create lifetime relationships. Not always the easiest relationships, um, but lifetime relationships. Um, as, a, as a point, I guess, um, my wife Nancy, uh, I don't know if I can tell this story, uh, is out with my son James, who's 31, um, for the eighth time, trying to help him get settled after leaving some kind of detention program or treatment program. So they're out in San Diego now, and it's not an answer to have a lifetime family, but for the most part, those families do last, even if they don't always function as families expect. Um, I do get calls pretty often from people who say, I'm thinking about adopting this child, uh, but, I, but this child may be drug exposed, and how important is that and do I really have to nail that down and do I really have to know and what if they are uh, and excuse me the thing I tell them is uh, that it's about it's about your expectations um, that if you're expecting that they're not drug exposed and this is going to be just like your sisters nieces and nephews it's probably not the right expectation that the expectation is that adoptions are gonna be difficult, whether kids were drug exposed um, or whether their mothers just went through a lot of stress because they were um, not sure whether their partner was gonna support them. They weren't sure whether they should have a termination. They weren't sure what was gonna happen. Um, so they had lots of hormones rushing and they had lots of cortisol cooking and um, they uh, weren't using drugs, but all those things can have an impact on a child. And that if you don't grapple with the fact that adoptions can be lifelong, uh, 
and almost always are, but also are likely to be difficult, and you go into this without, with expectations that if they're not drug exposed, then there's no worries, then that isn't really a good history of adoption. There is some good news about this um, from some longitudinal work that's been done, not a lot of it, but um, Bill Feigelman, who's a longtime adoption scholar, has done some work with the National Study of Family Growth. And um, what he showed was that if you look at kids when they get into their 30, it, so he followed this, these three groups, kids who are in, uh, born to couples who stay together, kids who are born to couples who got divorced, and kids who are adopted. And that if you looked at them as teenagers, um, the kids who born to couples who stayed together were doing much better, the adopted kids were struggling, and the kids whose families divorced were struggling. Um, if you looked at them at 30, um, they all um, looked a little, lot more alike, um, that there was maybe a longer period of, um, of uh, catching up for, for adopted kids, but that there was some evidence that they do. Okay. Um, so this is more about, this is backing up a little bit to get into the well-being side of things. And I've got a lot of slides here, and I may not go through all of them. Um, I won't, but, um, what was it really, 11.30, okay. Um, so, Ellen, how much more time? We end at noon. Okay. Yeah, I will, um, I will try to move quickly. Okay, so I'm just going to show you a few things. Um, one of the things we did is we got child behavior checklist scores and we looked at how kids were doing at baseline and how they were doing 18 months later and by age. And one of the things that um, we showed was that the green percentages are percentages that have gone up, okay? So um, kids whose changes were positive, whether they were in home or whether they were out of home. So many kids don't improve. Uh, we can see that. But if there's change, it tends to be on the positive side um, for child behavior checklists. Um, if you look at some other risk behaviors, uh, self-reported delinquency, suicide risk, and substance abuse for older kids, you see that, again, many kids don't improve. Um, but there's um, uh, a reduction in uh, suicide risk, which is a good thing. We are pretty good at, at uh, reducing that harm. Uh, but substance abuse does not go away just because Child Welfare Services gets involved. And there's some evidence that um, more of the, the changes are, more kids are changing in the negative direction. So twice as many kids, 29% of the kids are changing in the negative direction as compared to 14% in the positive direction. I did not put those who do not change um, on here. Okay. Um, so... I think it's safe to say that our interventions are not that powerful, uh, but for the most part, they're not um, iatrogenic, that there's more positive change than negative change. Um, caregiver perceptions of service adequacy. I thought you might be interested in this. One of the other things from NSCAR is we asked the workers, um, or we asked the families, what do you think of the services you're getting? Uh, the thing that they liked the best um, was, um, the uh, services for, that were provided by the child welfare workers, uh, the things that they liked the least um, were, um, oops, let me go back, um, sorry. Um, the things that they liked the least, and it's not well reflected on this slide, were the services that they got referred to. So they generally thought that child welfare workers listened, were responsive, were respectful, but they generally thought that the places that child welfare workers sent them were um, not very helpful. So that's, um, that's a bit of a, a piece for all of us to think about in terms of trying to make sure that we continue to be good listeners and thoughtful, but that we try to um, shore up some of the services that are received. Um, so I'm not gonna take you through all of those. Um, there is actually one piece that you, I think it's really important to know about that we haven't talked about. These are the many neglected kids that we have provided child welfare services to. Joe Doyle is an economist, rigorously trained economist from the University of Chicago, who unlike most economists decided to study foster care rather than um, 
global um, markets or hedge funds or something like that. And what he did was he looked at placements of, of um, kids in Illinois who had been neglected, not the most severe cases, but general neglect cases, um, and uh, looked to see what happened to them if they happened to get placed into foster care or they happened to remain at home. Turns out there were some workers who were systematically placing a lot of kids in foster care and other workers who were systematically placing a lot of kids at home. And the, and the, kid, the families were basically being randomly assigned to these workers. So it was a bit of an experiment based on worker proclivities. A good study design. What he found was that um, if you looked at these neglected kids, 6 to 12, um, who were not sexually abused or severely physically abused, but just neglected, who went into the child welfare system, they did way worse uh, if they went into foster care. They were as risky as some people might have thought their homes were. For those kids, foster care had long-term negative impacts in the state of Illinois. Um, they had um, more juvenile justice involvement, more homelessness, more mental health problems, more um, a whole range of problems. And that, I think, is an important message, that if you've got our intervention is not so necessary. If you don't have really significant safety issues um, that um, are, are obvious, but you're sort of using foster care as a way to increase well-being or some general sense of protection, and, and I realize you don't think about it quite that way, but if that's sort of behind some of the ways you think about things, then we need to think about that again. Um, Heather Tausig, who's now at the Kemp Center, but used to be in San Diego, had some different findings. But these were from the long scan study many years ago. I tend to think they're a little out of date. But just to be fair, she found that kids who had been reunified did less well than kids remained in foster care um, some years ago. Um, I think it's important to recognize, and, and I'll wrap up fairly quickly here, that excellent services do matter. And I haven't really talked about excellent services. Um, KEEP was about the only one that I really mentioned that I think is a very important program. Um, this is a program that also comes out of the Oregon Social Learning Center. Phil Fisher is the PI, and it's called um, it's Multidimensional Treatment Foster Care. Remember I described that whole model with family therapy and daily reports, but it's for littler kids, for preschool kids. And one of the things that they did in this study is they looked to see whether good, consistent parenting from foster parents could improve cortisol levels um, and also could improve um, uh, brain images that would show that kids had better self-regulation. Basically, what they found was, yes, in both cases, they improved cortisol levels. They also improved kids' ability to do tasks where they were getting feedback. I don't know if many of you have um, worked with kids where you feel like the feedback just bounces off them. Uh, they don't, you know, we try to be positive, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. We try to use timeout, it doesn't seem to make any difference. Um, well, that's what they found in this study, was that uh, for kids who um, were in the um, MTFC, uh, you can't see the blue line up above it, that there was a big difference in how they reacted when they got positive feedback or negative feedback. Um, but for the kids... Um, who were in regular foster care, and again, you can't see the blue line very well, there was almost no difference. They reacted the same. Uh, the point of this is that, um, oh, and so the other thing that squares this up is that they also looked to see how many placement moves these kids made. And in general, the way that the placement move curves look is that for every placement you had, the probability of another placement becomes higher. And so you start getting these curves, curves like this, that if you've had you know, 1.83 placements, your likelihood of going to the next highest level of placement gets worse. And that's why you see these kids who just start moving all the time. And what they showed was for the, um, the bottom group, the group that was in multidimensional treatment foster care, CP, that the number of prior placements they had made no difference in the prediction of future placements. That this changed their trajectory, got them off of that steep line of having higher probabilities from their history, basically in some ways wiped out their prior history of a lot of placement moves and allowed them to um, reduce their, their future placement moves. So the nice thing about this study is it links up um, some 
neuroscience, with some cortisol measurement, with, some, uh, with actual placement moves, and I think it's a great example of how much of a difference we can make if we really use good interventions. Um, the social benefits side, um, only you know all this, and I'll be happy to leave this. Oh, I have, um, Ellen will have these slides, but the basic message is there's a lot of financial cost to kids who are maltreated, and um, there are a number of different ways to estimate that, and all of those uh, basically argue that we are way um, underfunded in child welfare. Um, so um, I'm now in my last couple of slides. Summary. So uh, we do appear to increase safety, enhance the well-being of children who have suffered serious threats to our future, yet we do have a lot of re-abuse. We do have a lot of undetected abuse, and we do have um, an uneven record in terms of really giving kids a developmental boost. Um, and uh, these kids are failing poorly when they come in. That's not surprising to people. I think there's more attention to that in the country. Um, I think when we provide excellent services, we can make a huge difference. When we provide mediocre services or services as usual, we often don't make a difference. So our challenge, I think, for all of us is to figure out not only how to get those different services developed, but get them integrated into service activities. And I'm delighted to see that Wisconsin has a waiver which should give you more flexibility to use some evidence-based practices and to try some new things that may then help to reduce placement instability uh, and other things that are related to uh, and re-entries re and other things that are related to um, poor uh, performance. I think there's no question that there's a lot of interest in the workforce um, that um, that in other countries as well, the UK has a big initiative uh, called repositioning social work. Uh, and uh, I think in this country, there's more attention than ever through the National Center on Child Welfare Workforce. Uh, SAMHSA is really interested in workforce. Um, we have a new center at Maryland on um, child welfare and evidence-based practice that's never been funded before. So I think you're, in a, you're here at a good time. Uh, this is a great opportunity to do some of that. Um, so I think with that, I will um, thank you for your attention and open it up for some questions. Thank you. Yes. So I don't know for sure, but for the most part, um, the kids are, were a bit older when they left foster care. Um, most of the mortality rates for kids at home are for kids quite young. Um, so my guess has always been that these are kids who ended up leaving foster care, going out, getting involved with groups that were, had violence as a, a core um, strategy, drug involvement, um, other things like that where there were, where was a high murder rate amongst their peers. So I, my sense is that there's, if there were safety risks, those were from their families, but that their mortalities, and we had some evidence about that, tended, I think, probably to be more from their peers. Because the link appears to be from the homes that they're in. I think that's my brother. Yeah, yeah. No, I think um, my expectation is when they left foster care, they got involved with street life that was ultimately the um, source of that um, threat to their lives and, and their deaths. Other questions? Yes? I have a question on the which study? Um, the which study? Yeah, study? ACES study, OK. Uh-huh. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so I am not an expert on the ACES studies. Um, my understanding about them is that it's a panel study. The original study is a panel study of, uh, and also involves follow back. So asking people to remember what their childhood was like and whether they had adverse childhood experiences. So I've always been a little skeptical about that. If you're not doing well at a certain point in your life, you may not remember your childhood the same way as somebody who's doing great. Um, so I think there's a bit of a loop there. But I don't have any doubt that adverse childhood experiences can have effects on cortisol and self-regulation and other factors which do have prolonged impact on people. Um, but I think your second question is um, one that I maybe know a little more about. Um, so one of the big challenges is, is, as you said, to try to embed evidence-based practices into the child welfare system. And um, this is something that we've spent a lot of time talking about in Maryland, and one of the reasons why I think they gave us this new center. Um, there are a few ways to do that. There's a project that the uh, state of Washington did, University of Washington did, and they're one of our partners in this new center, called Project Focus, and you can read about that. Um, Shannon Dorsey is the first author on a lot of those papers. Um, and Shannon's work basically looks at trying to train child welfare workers about evidence-based practice in a couple of ways. One of them is actually providing them with information, so surveying the community and saying, um, who are the providers of evidence-based practice in mental health services that can help when we have an anxious child, okay? Or when we have a child who might need TFCBT. Um, and so that when you think about referrals, you're not just making a referral to this agency or that agency, but you're trying to make a referral to someone who you think actually knows the evidence-based practice that you believe from your own understanding um, is mapped well and matched up well to what your child needs. Now, it takes some work with the mental health agencies for them to accept referrals, because they're not used to getting referrals that say, we did this trauma checklist, and when we see this child has high levels of trauma, and we want you to provide TFCBT. They're used to getting a referral that says, here's a new kid that's sent over from child welfare, um, and won't you provide some services to them? And they may play UNO with them, or they may give them TFCBT, and we often don't really know. Um, so that is trying to change, and that's what Project Focus has tried to change. Um, I certainly think there are there is room for embedding elements of evidence-based practices into your practice. One of the things that we've been talking about and writing about some at Maryland with our colleagues at UCLA, Bruce Chorpita and Eric DeLayden, um, is the common elements of practice and trying to figure out, okay, instead of taking TFCBT and all its empirically rated glory of in 16 weeks and all the different pieces in a certain order and with a certain, the manual's 200 something pages, um, Instead, you say, what are the elements of TFCBT that are really important? How do I learn those? And when I have a kid, and I'm a foster care worker, and I have a kid who's anxious about something and fearful about something, then maybe I sit down with a foster parent and the kid, and we work out an exposure strategy, because exposure is the key ingredient. And I can't teach the, mom to, the foster mom to do TFCBT, but I can at least try to set up the logic of doing exposure, and maybe we can get something done that way. So I think that that's the way that we're trying to think about it, is helping workers to think about the elements that they can take and fit within their practice. It's better, of course, if there's a TFCBT referral. If someone really is you know, traumatized and they have uh, anxiety or fear or something like that. But that's not always going to be available. And I think there are other things we can do. We can all do what Patty Chamberlain suggests, you know, find four positive things for every suggestion that we make to change. Um, there are other pieces, I think, that we can provide. We will be developing as part of the National Center an you know, a extension of the Project Focus Curriculum for Child Welfare Workers over the next five years. So stick around. Hopefully, we'll have something else for you. Great question. Other questions? Yes? Um, I work for the county as, as an analyst for Dane County. Uh, uh -huh. And I guess, you know, the outcomes that we always look at, you know, we're looking at re-referrals, re-entries, placement stability. I'm yeah. wondering if you have any other kind of metrics um, that you think that people that have access to administrative data should be looking at. Yeah. Um, and those are sort of the classics. 
I guess the one thing I would say is that um, there are pieces that could be better. So uh, one very important piece that could be better, and I don't know that anybody else has done this, so you could break new ground, is the severity of the abuse. Okay? So if um, a kid goes home from foster care and we have a new program that the University, you know, the state of Wisconsin has developed to do um, reentry uh, re prevention, and they're involved with that family, and everything falls apart, and it's clear the kid's not safe there, and the worker's in the home and takes the kid and puts her arm around him and says, you know, we're going to have to find you another place, and um, we're going to place you with relatives. It's very different than um, if the parent falls apart and ends up um, seriously injuring that child. Okay? Right now, the federal government counts those as the same thing. One of them is a preventive guidance of a child back into a better situation. The other is we, miss, we lost track of this risk and the worst thing that could happen happened and yet they get treated the same. That doesn't make any sense. Um, so I think we have to say, we have to come up with a more refined way of thinking about um, what reentry is, for example. The other thing is sometimes you get um, re-reports on kids who have been uh, reunified, and we don't count those. So uh, let's say there's kids reunified, and then there's five more reports, but they never get replaced. Uh, don't. Wouldn't we want to at least say that that's not the perfect reunification? Wouldn't we want to learn something from that rather than say, oh, that was a success. You know, um, we sent them home and they didn't come back in. So linking up the child abuse reporting and the foster care um, reentry data, I think, is, is important. So if you could crack those nuts, um, boy, I would retire right away. I would feel like that was a, quite an accomplishment, and um, I'd love to see that. But, it, it's tough. Um, severity is a tough thing to figure out, but we've got to figure it out. Treating every uh, report as the same just makes no sense. Other questions? Did you have one, Christy? Yes. Oh, so along that same line, treating everyone the same. So one of the things that I've struggled with um, just reading the literature over the years is how um, we conceptualize parenting vis-a-vis child maltreatment. You know, there's many dimensions of parenting, and I don't know that the field has given really careful thought, or the research community has given very careful thought to what are those common elements of parenting, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. we should be paying attention to. Yeah. Um, you know, not everybody can benefit from a home visiting program, and home visiting programs, even though they've been shown to be effective, don't have huge impacts. Yeah. But mostly what we do is send people to parenting classes, and I don't know that we've, we've really... Um, delved deeply and critically into what those parenting classes should be. Yeah. And I don't know if you have observations on that. I do have some. Um, I've been working with a doctoral student on a paper about parenting and sort of trying to figure out what the common elements of parenting programs are. Um, we took the strategy of looking at the California Evidence-Based Practice Clearinghouse. You all familiar with the California Evidence-Based Practice Clearinghouse? Okay, I'm on the Research Advisory Board. It's very helpful, even though it's from California. Um, and uh, one of the things that they do is they, for every um, evidence-based practice, they communicate with the um, developer and they ask them, what are the essential ingredients of, what are the, they call them essential components of this intervention? So you get a list of the things that they think are most important. So we tried to look at all the highly rated programs and then go in and look at what those essential components are. And... Um, what we found was that we couldn't really get, make much progress for kids zero to three. Uh, the programs were so different. Some of them were a year long, like um, CPP, um, uh, child psychotherapy program. Some of them were six weeks long, like safe, uh, safe care. There were, there were just so many differences. But for kids four to about 10, we found very common interventions. Um, anticipating um, problems and trying to head them off, um, a response costs for negative behavior, um, lots of attention. Uh, everybody does it a little differently, but there were basically a common set of things that have a 30-year history of being effective for that age group. 
I think for the older kids, it's much more about um, accepting. So the, the skills that you'd see in functional family therapy or MST or some of the family therapy work that gets done in schools of social work. Um, so it definitely varies by the age of child. And many of our parents have children all ages. Uh, we often think about parents with three-year-olds. Well, the parents we see in West Baltimore that we work with often have an infant, a three-year-old, a 12-year-old, and a 15-year-old. So they need to know something about all of those skills and which ones to use when, uh, which is challenging for them. But I think the next generation of work, and I hope you will join me with this, is to figure out what are these common components so that instead of teaching safe care and PCIT and MST and functional family therapy and TFCBT uh, so that you're all broke from paying for these things and you're on so many phone calls with the coach getting coaching and um, you've got manuals piled up on your desk so uh, you can't find your computer or your clients anymore, that we have to come up with a set of common components that we then strategically use with our families. But I think it's going to have to be one developmental group at a time. And I don't think the work is done. We've gotten a couple of pre-reviews on this paper, and people aren't that excited about it. They still want to go with the evidence-based practices. They're not ready yet to say, well, there's some common elements that are robust, and, and we can actually trust people to use them and get common outcomes. I guess they want me to prove that. Um, and right now, I'm kind of busy to try to figure that out. But, uh, <laughs> But there actually is some evidence from work that John Weiss and Bruce Jorpita have done in mental health services. If any of you want to look it up, um, they have done some really nice work where they've taken elements of a depression, anxiety, and conduct disorder, three different manuals, and they compared, if you had the social workers, and most of them were social workers, in the mental health clinic, use the manuals versus bringing the elements and letting the workers to a certain extent used them the way they saw that the families needed, that they had shorter lengths of stay and better outcomes with the, they call it the match approach as compared to the straight manualized approach and way better than treatment as usual. So there's some emerging evidence about this, but it hasn't been applied to parenting yet. 